thematic mapping with a twist, um, otherwise known as what I what I did in lockdown. Uh, a lot of the talks that I've heard over the, yesterday and today have all been about well, what on earth did we do sat in our own little places for, for a year. Um, th this is going to start out with um, a pre COVID. I, th I think now we're, we're everything's pre or post, isn't it? Or oh, not quite post yet. But so this was pre COVID. So this was about 2017, 2018. I took a trip to New York City with my daughter. And um, I don't know why, but she wanted to go in to Tiffany's. And um, as she was looking at the extremely expensive lumps of metal that happen to be also very small, um, I was taken by this lump of metal on the wall. This is a, um, a piece of art by an artist called um, Andrew Myers uh, of Charles Lewis Tiffany, which is in the flagship store in, in, uh, in New York. And I looked at this and, you know, from a distance, it looked just like a, uh, a nice grayscale picture. And as you moved up closer, you realized it was a bas relief um, of um, Tiffany himself made out of screws of different colors or different painted screws, I should say, and different heights. And so it was very textured. And I log these kind of things from time to time because inspiration for maps come from pretty much anywhere. Um, but I picked out that little bit. Look at the non-aligned screw heads. That really bugged me uh, as a pedant. That, that bothered me. We'll come back to that. <coughs> Excuse me. By the way, it's also not been a very good year for somebody with a persistent chronic cough, I can tell you. I can clear a room as quickly as anybody. <laughs> um, so during my day job, I make a lot of election maps, as, as many of you probably are aware. Here's one of the 2016 presidential election results as daisymetric dot density. And, and I was continually getting questions about how are you going to map the 2020 result? What, what style are you going for? What, what approach? Uh, what technique, perhaps? Um, and... Then COVID times hit, early 2020. I found myself working from home, as we all pretty much did. Um, I had time to think. Um, the eight-minute commute across Redlands every morning and evening um, you know, was now save time. Um, I also had access to non-standard office space, like my garage, and a whole range of different cartographic tools that I don't have in my office at work. At work. And I recalled the, the Myers portrait uh, of Tiffany, and the map was conceived, some sort of 3D thematic map. So first it was deciding on what constituted the terrain for the screw height in my map. And I've seen a few people make uh, DEMs in the last few years um, using screws like this just to create elevation models, which are terrific. But I wanted this to be about thematic data. So I began a prototype by using the 2016 election results, and here's the turnout. And I decided this was going to be my terrain, this interpolated turnout, where people live as opposed to where they don't. And I'd end up encoding the voting patterns somewhat differently. So I constructed a grid of points. Um, each one of these was represented as a screw head symbol to get a sense of the screw density. And this ended up being 1,162 screws at a 50 mile interval um, at a scale of one to seven million. Um, so I'm already getting cartographically nerdy um, in this. This creates a map of about 24 by 16 inches. So screw height, and diameter is going to be turnout. Um, reds are going to be Republicans, blues are going to be Democrats, and so on and so forth. And the base map was going to be simply red and blue states once the results came in. So first job is making the base map. So I went into the garage, and I found a bit of butcher block that had been lying around from a kitchen renovation sometime earlier. And I then built the base map uh, by creating the frame using a, a power tool number one, this circular saw. Um, and that was it. That's my base. That's probably the easiest base map you're ever going to be able to create. Well, it needed a little bit more work. Once I'd locked in the dimensions, I exported a DXF of the states, sent it off to uh, somebody who then laser cut me the states as a puzzle. Um, power tool number two, although I didn't, didn't own it, is a CNC router that cut these shapes. And then I positioned the plywood, you know, about a quarter inch thick plywood across the top of the base map. Um, and traced around the shapes. And crucially, for areas of land or islands that abutted water, uh, I was thinking ahead here for something um, that will quite literally become clear later on in the presentation, uh, but I wanted about a half inch buffer around uh, all of the areas that abutted water. Okay. The plan then was to inlay the puzzle into the base map itself. 
So this is power tool number three. There's a prize for if you can count all these up at the end. Um, this is a Dremel with a, a router bit set to a depth of uh, about uh, three eighths of an inch or little thereabouts. And this gave me the precision needed to hollow out those outlines that I'd just uh, uh, penciled uh, across the base map. Um, well, that was all well and good, but more power. You always, I found, need more power. So I took out a larger router with a, uh, a half-inch bit, uh, which made very light work of hollowing out the rest of the, the, the base map. This is very cathartic cartography, but it's also uh, runs a lot of risk because if this router suddenly scoots off into the Atlantic, I, I've ruined my map, okay? Um, you know, there's no, there's no m mistakes. Well, that's not true because with cartography, there are always mistakes. And if you look here, this is a very rough uh, piece of work. But um, I, I, I tend to find that a lot of my maps have a lot of rough work and I just cover it up with the top coat. Um, so you're never ever going to see this again. Um, so I, I fitted the puzzle pieces. I got power tool number five, which is a Dremel with a flexible, flexible bit and sanding bit to make some minor corrections just to make sure everything fitted. Uh, neatly. Meanwhile, I'm sure we've all spent time on the internet in the last year and a half, and I, I started getting into the nerdiness of wood screws and the different gauges and lengths in which they're manufactured. Uh, fascinating topic of a talk all of its own, which I'm not going to go into, but I decided to classify my uh, screws on my map into 10 different classes of turnout values. Um, they, they were going to have larger gauges uh, and heads as well as being longer for larger areas of turnout. That's the sort of logic visual variable I was, I was going for. So I then worked out um, the number of screws I needed uh, of each gauge, of each diameter, each length. I calculated the depth that was going to be needed to be drilled into the base map in order to reveal the correct amount of height um, and what would be left protruding uh, over, over, across the map. So I ordered enough screws and a few spares because this was based on 2016, and I didn't know what the turnout was going to be in 2020. Um, and these sat around for a few months. <coughs> so back to the map base. This would be around October 2020, about a month away from the election. I primed all the woods, the, uh, the plywood states with an undercoat, and I likely could have given most of the states the top coat right there and then, because, of course, many of them don't change. They don't flip from one election to the other. Um, the pile in the middle are those that were um, a little more marginal, and uh, I, des I certainly wasn't going to paint those before the uh, actual results were known. Um, so I decided to leave all of them until the result was, know was known, which, as we we're all aware, turned out to be a good idea. So I sat back. I sat there with my Crayolas, another classic cartographic tool to mark off the states as the results came in, uh, which ended up taking a couple of weeks due to, well, well, let's not go there at all. And eventually, I got around to being able to paint the states without fear of legal challenge. Um, so I was reasonably confident at this stage, and I got my pile of states uh, red and blue. So then it was a case of gluing this puzzle into the hollowed out base with a hole for Great Salt Lake in Utah, because frankly, it's too big to ignore, ignore on any thematic map. Uh, so there's a little hole there. Uh, also, one of my buddies is from Utah, so I made sure I had a little uh, Utah thing in there as well. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands were a little bit tricky, tricky even at sort of this scale. Um, just getting the glue and the various islands positioned and rotated correctly, because I know somebody's going to pick me up on the angle of one island being slightly <laughs> off, um, which is fine. Back to the computer, the digital map, uh, time to sort out where all the screws go. And I attributed each point feature with all of the turnout data, all of the results, and so on. It's, it's interpolated results, by the way. And each point feature was then um, given a screw gauge, sized by shank hole size. It was given the height of the screw relative to turnout, and the depth, and all of that information. And I added those as labels onto the points here as well. And given that this map was never, ever going to be seen by anyone, let alone anyone at a cartography conference, I left the default GIS legend exactly as it, as it was, <laughs> which I'm sure you'll appreciate. Now, um, normally you'd want to print this out on your beautiful large format printer sitting in the hallway at work, but unfortunately that was not available to me. So I dug out a pretty crappy little printer at home and printed out eight sheets 
and use that other cartographic um, piece of equipment, Scotch Magic Tape, to uh, stick all these together to give me this template. Um, and that was then taped to the top of the map, and this is where another dangerous element came in. I had to uh, use power tool number six back to the Dremel with various drill bits of different gauges, uh, different sizes, and a plunger to get the correct depth. Um, this process required many changes of drill bit uh, size to get the pilot hole dimensions correct. Now, this was important because if I'm starting to drive a sort of a fairly wide screw into very fragile plywood, um, it's going to crack the whole thing. Uh, and I was never going to know whether I cracked it until I'd finished this whole process. So this was a little bit sweaty palm time. But when I'd finished this, I peeled back the template, which revealed this. And uh, I showed this to my map buddy, John Nelson. He said, stop there, lacquer it. That's, that's good. Okay. And uh, I, <laughs> I tend to agree with him. I think this is a pretty nice piece of, piece of work as is. These sort of proportional rings of sawdust and wood dust dependent on the size of the hole that I had to, uh, I had to drill. Um, fortunately, once it was cleaned up, there was no damage at all. And I could begin to drive the screws into the base map. <coughs> So I cleaned the base map, added filler when necessary, I lacquered it, uh, drove the screws in. And remember that bugbear about the Tiffany map having all of the uh, screw heads at the wrong angles? Um, not on my map. No, 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 no. <laughs> so I very painstakingly and carto uh made sure all those screw heads were rotated uh, and aligned correctly. Now this was really slow progress. Uh, but I enlisted more power, power tool number seven. The electric screwdriver came to the rescue to get most of the uh, screw in. And this reduced soreness and blistering um, because, you, you know, you, you hurt for your art. And the manual screwdriver was used really just to align those screw heads. And in the meantime, um, I'd already had a nameplate made for me by uh, Ned Drummond, who I'd met at the last in-person NASIS. And this is why the community is so great. Um, uh, and that was the name I chose for the nameplate. Uh, it was deliberately playful. Um, was, all right, I won't even go there. But I, I thought it was a nice name, nice play on words. And once all the screws were in the map, the nameplate was itself screwed to the map. Uh, but the map wasn't quite finished. So you remember that buffer that I'd hollowed out? Um, I happen to think that every map that borders water has to have some sort of vignette to make it distinct from... Uh, the rest of the base map. So I decided, having gone to all this um, effort, to experiment with uh, filling this gap with epoxy resin, which meant that the map also had to be extremely level, as I found out. Um, <clears throat> so here it's just been poured. You can still see the bubbles, which thankfully um, dissipated as it dried. That's not quite the end. So this is now the 2020 results on the computer. In my home office, I'd moved the map from the garage inside. That wasn't a popular move. Um, and rather than getting all technical, I simply eyeballed the colors on the screen and painted the screw heads uh, with an enamel paint uh, with dark red, meaning a great share of vote, and so on and so forth. Typical standard depiction. And that's, that's the map, uh, the final multivariate 3D map with screw height, gauge, and diameter as turnout. Um, the base color of the, the, the puzzle is red or blue to show the state result. Screw heads shaded according to their share of votes. Um, and, you know, you can, you can analyze this map. You can see the great swathes of heavy Republican vote in uh, the largely smaller populated parts of the country and contrast that with some very large uh, protruding screws that are, are predominantly blue. Um, it's sort of typical analysis of, of an election map, I guess. Southeast, large populations of marginal voting that just tip Republican to Florida and Democrat in Georgia. The predominantly Democratic Northeast. Um, you have to indulge me here. I spent a year making this, so I'm just going to show you some pretty pictures. Uh, and, and that's really it. <coughs> and uh, the highly populated and predominantly Democratic West Coast with the largest screw on the map in or near LA County. Now, every map needs QA. So you get the most discerning person you can to assess it, and you realize that they really couldn't care about it whatsoever. So after months of work, uh, our dog, Wisley, was left very unimpressed. Um, and also, you'll notice this, this map is still outside, which is where it remains, because I actually don't have anywhere 
to put a map that weighs the size of this sort of bag of a cement weight and is that size inside the house. I'm actually looking for somewhere, someone who will take it and uh, put it on display somewhere. That would be great. Um, but to be fair, just to sort of finish this, uh, Wisley uh, was more interested in his own map. He spent lockdown making a map, which I'm not going to spend 15 minutes talking about, but um, he did want me to talk a little bit about it. Um, so we, we strapped an old GPS re receiver onto him for a year's worth of morning and evening walks. Um, and then we explored track logs and patterns. And I've written a whole load of blogs about symbolizing lines and experimenting with lines. Um, but, but I ultimately settled on creating a long form 20 minute animation of, of his year's worth of walks, which you can find on YouTube just by uh, searching for Wisley walks. Um, he walked 1,332 miles in total. He kept his owners relatively sane and relatively fit. Um, and I ended up with this. The routes are colored by frequency of walk to add emphasis. The current walks had an animated worm and they flash as the walk is finished. There's a cumulative mile count in the bottom left-hand corner and a little Wisley cartoon scale bar um, there for, I forget exactly what it, what it is, one mile is one length of the dog or something like that. Um, bar graph illustrates temperature. That happened to become very important for, for Wisley as he's walking because he's wearing a fur coat, whether it's 40 outside, no, here I go, Celsius, whether it's over 100 outside or, or not. Um, so the summer months in Red Reddens are pretty, pretty hot and he didn't like that and he walked a lot shorter. Um, there's a monthly timeline along the bottom to give some sort of um, assessment of where you are uh, because this video is 20 minutes long. So, you know, if you've got absolutely nothing better to do this evening, please fire up YouTube and go and spend 20, 20 minutes walking our dog for it. It took us a lot longer to do it in real life, I can tell you. Um, and occasionally you'll see a few labels come up, but I didn't really want to tell you precisely where I lived on my map that's now public, so I kind of obfuscated a few things on there. And the final power tool, um, I was getting really into power tools by now. So I developed a little bit of a fetish for power tools across the year. And this last one was really fun. We, we ripped out most of our unenvironmentally friendly uh, sod in Southern California, replaced it with hard landscaping and dug some holes for a few uh, sort of trees and what have you. Um, I, I did have an idea to maybe scrape a map out of the garden, but um, <clears throat> the other Household occupant said no, very firmly to that, and she was right. Uh, so, but maybe I'll maybe that's the next idea for the next pandemic. How about that? Oh, I can't end on that note, can I? Um, all right, I'll end on this note. So, um, in the real world, I also wrote a book, but I'm not going to talk to you about the book. Um, if you want to come and have a chat about it, then please do. But it's a map of uh, 101 ways to map election data. Uh, the wooden map is not in the book because it didn't fit. So with that, I'm happy to take questions or, or whatever. Thanks. No, I'd love to have brought the map, but I've probably got arrested trying to get it on aircraft, actually. I don't know. Gordon? You do a fair amount of woodworking. Uh, a little. Oh, uh, do I do a fair amount of woodworking at home? Not, not really. I mean, I did the whole kitchen renovation, and I, you know, I mess around, but no. I, I noticed really Yeah, yeah. The question was basically: there's no damage on the the screws. You're absolutely right. Yeah, if you're going to do the job, you do it right, right? <laughs> Uh, that's a really interesting quest question for, uh, so the question was, have I shared the map with anybody who's blind? Um, because it could be tactile in, in, a, in an interesting, that's an interesting question for two reasons. One, I hadn't thought about it. Um, and it's, that would probably be a, a really interesting thing to do. And secondly, I'm kind of losing sight in my right eye. So I might have to end up using this as a tactile map as well. Okay. Thank you.